The media loves to swoon about the rapid growth of the cannabis industry. In fact, the latest estimates are that by 2020, the cannabis industry will have revenue of $44 billion a year. That's on par with the entire gross domestic product of the country of Panama. The market will swell as more and more states legalize and new marijuana products are developed to respond to that demand. Those of us who have been cannabis enthusiasts for decades have had access for a long time to the casual, unlicensed market. We enjoy cannabis and use it to heal ourselves. Now, though, we're beginning to experience a change like has never occurred in cannabis before. We've reached a tipping point where new folks are getting turned on to cannabis who may never have used it before. Some are coming by way of medical marijuana because they are seeking natural relief without the side effects of pharmaceuticals. Some are looking for an alternative to alcohol for partying because even though we like it, alcohol is still a poison and cannabis is much safer than alcohol. While others simply were always cannabis tokers who just didn't know it yet, now that they have legal access to marijuana and have tried it, they have fallen in love with the creativity and good feelings that come with it. It is these people who are the future of cannabis. They will vote for it with their ballot, and they will vote for it with their cash. And nothing moves mountains in America like cash does, right? If you enjoy hearing smart discussions that dive deep into cannabis health, business, and technique, I encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter. Every week, you'll receive a new podcast episode delivered right to your inbox, along with commentary on a couple of the most important news items from the week and videos, too. Don't rely on social media to let you know when a new episode is published. Sign up for the updates and make sure you don't miss an episode. You are listening to Shaping Fire, and I'm your host, Shango Los. My guest today is Jane West. Jane is CEO of her eponymous cannabis lifestyle brand, Jane West. She's also founder of Women Grow, a for-profit entity that serves as a catalyst for women to influence and succeed in the cannabis industry. Jane is a voice for mainstream consumers and women like her who stand to benefit greatly from an alternative to alcohol and pharmaceuticals. Today, we're going to talk with Jane about the wave of new cannabis consumers entering the market now and how cannabis product developers can create innovative approaches to meeting their needs. Welcome to the show, Jane. Oh, thank you so much for having me. So so you first began cultivating this, this new market of cannabis enthusiasts through your series called Edible Events. And the events were you know, more upscale than nearly any other cannabis events. And they included fine art and classical music. And they're held at times that you know, worked for folks who had kids at home. Did you find that the folks who came out to these events were, were already integrated into the cannabis scene? Or were they primarily cannabis curious folks who had found a home um, and an event that 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 you put on and spoke to them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so in 2014 i scheduled out 12 edible events one for each month and we were actually able to produce seven of them before the city just basically shut it down so each one each event there were more and more people who were newbies and who were cannabis curious the first the first couple of events were were almost pure cannabis industry people um people that were in the cannabis industry or people that were looking to get into it um by the second event i had already been featured in a few different news stories so people wanted to come to the events not only to be part of it, but also to meet all the different sponsors and contacts that were there. So that was definitely a component at the beginning. Um, but as the events continued to happen on a regular basis, and especially after our partnership formed with the Colorado Symphony Orchestra, we really started to bring in a new group of consumers who were very curious about incorporating cannabis into their lives. So at the beginning, was your goal originally um, to, to bring in the, the cannabis industry folks first, or was your goal originally to bring in the newbies? Because of course, with this show, our goal is to hopefully inspire people in other cities to do the similar thing. So who was your original target? Um, honestly, my original target was me. <laughs> I am a regular cannabis consumer and I absolutely prefer, uh, cannabis to alcohol as like my substance of choice on a Friday night. And I simply wanted to create a really high end event with great food and wonderful music in an art gallery that I would wear a cocktail dress to on a Friday night and also be able to openly consume cannabis there. Um, and so as a result, in order to accomplish that goal, I needed both sides of that group. I needed the cannabis companies um, who 
I was also providing them a great opportunity to showcase their brands, especially with all the advertising limitations we have in this space. Um, and I wanted to learn more about all their products. I mean, at, up until the day of legalization, adult use legalization in, on January 1st, 2014 in Colorado, I really it was only a flower consumer. And so I wanted to learn more about all these incredible infused products on the market as well. Um, so they really became like a great place for consumer education about new products coming out. And then it was a safe, welcoming location, like right in the heart of the Art Santa Fe Arts District that you could go attend a cannabis event, which absolutely um, normalized that. Um, as I was building the event series, I went to several events that were advertised as cannabis events um, just to kind of see what was happening in the market. And most of them were like, they were not well organized. Um, they were in locations that were not like central to Denver. Um, and they, the ones I did attend were not the scene that I really wanted to be part of and didn't reflect my cannabis experience. So you were saying that the, as you did more of these events, more of these, these crossover new folks came and got involved. How do you think that they found out about it? Because, you know, people who are not into cannabis mm -hmm. don't necessarily read all of the cannabis things. Mm -hmm. So were you putting some kind of copy out there or through the mm -hmm. press to let them know that this event was for them? I mean, I did my very best to build a straightforward web page of each one of the events and I listed off all of the um, menus and I, I really also tried to feature all utilize the network of everyone we were showcasing at the event to promote the event so for instance we were in one of the best art galleries in Santa Fe at Space Gallery and we would talk about the different artists that were showcasing there and at each one of the events there'd be some like special activities so we'd we would talk in advance about how you can come watch this particular like body painter um, or this woman that was skilled in origami, um, different things, depending on the event. Um, but, you know, candidly, the, the very the most important thing I did to promote the events was to just keep my message solid with every single media interview that I had the opportunity to take at the time. Um, I invited a lot of like smaller uh, media companies and even guest bloggers um, who were really interested in the space and were so wanted to attend. And so I would always have a pretty large uh, media and PR list and take extra time to talk to each one of them when they were at the events. So um, I could really make sure that they understood what we were trying to create here and could share our message. Often when anything is taboo or that and when often when anything that is taboo first comes to the mainstream, you know, there's usually lots of giggling about it. Right. So mm -hmm. do you find that these new crossover cannabis enthusiasts have to spend a little time, you know, working out the fact that they're doing something that until recently had to be underground and instead was now only illegal federally, but essentially it was OK for them to be at the party? Mm -hmm. um, yes, I, I absolutely do. For the cannabis curious, I, in my opinion, the first step is the most important one. Like they have to decide that they're interested enough to go into the dispensary and see what products are there for them. Um, but after that very first step, um, they see this whole world of different products and up uh, and like, for instance, in Colorado, I'm referencing Colorado, but. There's so many different high quality products that have all, in all different uptake systems and there's chocolates and mints and tinctures and patches and vape pens. And, and as you're looking at the products and evaluating them, you realize that this is not what you thought it was. And, you know, these are high quality products being made um, by companies that have been in the space for a long period of time. And, and you, you learn that as you learn about all the different brands. And so once you've taken that first step through the door of the dispensary, um, you really, your eyes are opened up to all the things that this can be. And then just curiosity takes over. And um, so that seems to be kind of the standard newbie path in Colorado, at least. 
that the idea of sparking their curiosity <clears throat> is a great goal. And, and the idea of taboo, let's talk about for yourself for a moment. I know you promoted these parties originally under the pseudonym Jane West, mm-hmm. and the, the ink on the new canvas laws were barely dry at this point. Did you create your pseudonym of Jane West to keep your cannabis life separate from your day job? Or was the idea intentionally from the beginning to start breathing life into a lifestyle brand called Jane West? So... At the very heart of it, the idea was to intentionally recreate my professional life. So there were a lot of different reasons behind that, um, but I wanted to recreate what I was doing professionally in this world and what I was spending my time creating. Um, And so there were a lot of reasons to, to, to use a pseudonym at the time, especially cause I didn't know a single person in the industry and, 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 uh, and I wasn't sure what I was going to do with my, um, more corporate job if this started to work. Um, but honestly there's, a, I mean, it just made it a lot, um, administratively easier to start a new business. I'd never done anything like that before. Um, I'm 40 years old and you know, when I, Growing up, I definitely had the mindset that I was going to go to college and then get a job and get a great job or do a great job. But um, I didn't really know any like entrepreneurs, like no one in my world is like hashtagging startup life. Like um, and so I was really you know, setting out to do something that I had never done before and kind of had to step into this whole new uh, bolder persona Um And so every step of the way, I've just tried my best to make really intentional decisions to create what I want to see in the world. And so part of that was started with recreating myself, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and also, you know, from, from the, from the bit I've talked about you and and from what I've read, you know, you definitely sound like a, a wonderful host and, and part of being a good host involves creating a space where your guests, you know, feel comfortable. Clearly the environments that you built were, you know, pleasant to be in, but did you find that you played a role kind of therapist to, in many cases too, like, like fluttering amongst the guests and helping them give themselves permission to be at a cannabis party? Um, definitely, definitely. I was always at the front. Actually, um, I have my master's degree in social work. Um, so I've always been a fairly good networker and especially with those, um, initial introductions with people, um, at all of the events, you know, we had a very welcoming, um, introduction. So we always had a front table, um, with very friendly, um, hosts that would kind of ask people if it was their first time and walk them through, um, you know, where everything is. And, and so really it's about just being welcoming and open and answering people, que- people's questions. Um, in the, our third event, um, me so hungry, we had this whole like origami station and then next to the origami station, we had a joint rolling station. Um, and just kind of like candidly being like, okay, how do you do this? How would you roll a joint? Pull out your papers. Let's, um, let's, you know, first we are going to grind up our cannabis and then you roll up the filter and, and it was great. And by not making it like too cool for school, like you should already know how to roll a joint, man. Like, and just being open, like, okay, let's see, let's try it out. Let's see if you can learn how to do it. Um, it kind of broke down those barriers and like demystified people's thoughts about what the event would even be to begin with. Um, and I think a lot of times in the beginning, there was a lot of conversations about the event itself, which helped, um, spur more conversations about cannabis. So it, it was a topic of conversation that you were even there, especially by like the third and fourth event when we had people from like 12 different States flying in for the events. Um, so it just became like a really fun, super social setting of like-minded people that all thought, you know, this was the place they wanted to be on Friday night and it made for a great group. I really like your approach of not making it too cool for school, right? Because so much of our industry is very elitist and everybody's trying to get farther and farther out over the edge. But you brought it all the way back um, to, hey, let's have fun and make this ultra simple so that we can be very inclusive. And I really like that. 
um, <clears throat> there's still some risk in participating, especially for you know the folks that you were appealing to that were less than counterculture. How do you suggest that newcomers to cannabis weigh the aspect that they could still get fired for having cannabis in their system or if they saw somebody from work? I'm sure that some people vocalized their concern about being outed. And so I'd love to hear before we go to the first commercial what you kind of told them from your from your therapist role on how to get over that or make that decision for themselves. Right. So, um, so first of all, no matter what you have to like evaluate what your drug policy is at work and, and make those decisions for yourself. So separate of, of possibly like being released from your job for consuming cannabis, which is an important topic we should talk about. Um, at, at my, what we had to make a decision or at every single event regarding filming. And so this is how, this really was what mainly pushed this topic uh, among guests because I could have not allowed filming. Um, and at every single one of the events, there were, le- I mean, the reason the name Edible Events Company and and Jane West and everything we were doing is, no, is, so, is known so far and wide is because so many media partners were allowed to attend all of the events and were allowed to film all the events. Um, and that was a decision that I made early on and it it definitely affected attendance of the, of the, of the events because there were so many people at that time and still today who would not be comfortable being at a cannabis consumption event and being filmed or photographed consuming, um, which I understand. Um, however, at the same time, um, it's kind of a catch 22 because until we, have more mainstream consumption occurring. Um, there won't be the visuals out there that this is normal. Everyone's doing this. Your neighbor tries it. Your mom tries it. You know, it, it's okay. Um, and it's going to be part of, you know, our legal lifestyles of the future. Um, but unless we film it and unless we like capture these moments and, and take lots of pictures of the party and show people what it looks like and demystify that. So, um, so we, de- so we allowed for filming at, at all of the events. And as a result, there's great imagery of all of our incredibly classy symphony events and, and the, our brunches and all the other things we've done that really keep putting this like, you know, positive, um, look on what we're doing here and showing people that, that this is, this is totally, this is normal and you should come to the events and you should, you, it's a great place to try new products and meet new people and start to learn how to incorporate cannabis into your life, whether you use cannabis at that particular event or not. Um, I think a lot of people bought a ticket and for their first one, they just kind of came to see what it would be like and then came to future events and all the symphony events because, they decided um, that they wanted to be part of it and they wanted to try it too. Well, I, I applaud your approach because, you know, a lot of people who, who aren't involved with the, the creation of normalization think that normalization is just about the law changing. And really, that's, that's just the beginning of normalization. The normalization is when people start feeling safe to discuss uh, their cannabis use and go out and use and, and use it socially and not be afraid to be outed. And that's exactly the approach that you went for. We're going to go ahead and take a short break and re- re- be right back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. And my guest today is Jane West, founder of Women Grow and CEO at Jane West. If you like podcasts like Shaping Fire, chances are that you'll like audiobooks too. Just like with podcasts, audiobooks speak to you, tell you stories, and teach you stuff. Here's the thing. Audible.com has an offer that I want to tell you about. Right now they are offering a trial of their audiobook service for absolutely free. You can go to shapingfire.com forward slash audible and you'll get a free audiobook. Straight up. You can listen to it on your mobile device, computer, or download it and listen to it, you know, like anywhere. It's really simple. Of course, they want you to subscribe to their service after the free trial and enjoy audiobooks forever, but you don't have to. All you have to do to get the free audiobook of your choice is to just check out the service for free. And the service is pretty great. There are whole sections on permaculture, sci-fi, history, um, biography. Hell, you can even listen to a book about card counting in blackjack. Whatever, it's all pretty rad. So that's the deal. Your first book is free. It's easy to sign up. 
it's easy to quit, and their online library of free books is pretty incredible. So just check it out. Go to shapingfire.com forward slash audible to find out more, or just click on the link in this week's newsletter. Welcome back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. I am your host, Shango Lose, and our guest this week is Jane West, founder of Women Grow and CEO at Jane West. So during the first set, we were talking about what it's like to have all of these folks who are new to cannabis find out about the events, attend the events, and, and how uh, you act as kind of a therapist to help them feel comfortable and welcome. And so that brings us up to the million-dollar question, right, which is for the folks who chose to use cannabis at their first event. Events, you know, how did they handle that? Because, you know, as we know, with people who are new to cannabis, sometimes they can over imbibe and, and dosing is a constant challenge for newbies. How did you prepare your guests for a good experience and not becoming over medicated? Mm -hmm. Well, here in Colorado, there's a really great alliance that has formed among all the infused product manufacturers and they work closely with um, the Colorado Department of Health to create an entire campaign around start low go slow um, and so that was very useful because they created you know third party materials that that helped inform new consumers that were part you know the government was part of making them with us and so that helped us just keep the message universal among all the bud tenders and among tourists to Colorado start low go slow and then there's backup information behind that it's basically was the good to know campaign um which i love um and so so we always kind of keep to that mantra additionally we at our at the events we're throwing now you go to the dispensary and you acquire a goodie bag of all of the this variety of, of products. And so there's information about each of the products inside of there. And then you choose, um, you know, it, it was BYOC, like you choose what you're consuming and how over the course of the night um, based on all that information. And it's great because we're so familiar with each one of the products in the bag that we can provide, you know, inquisitive guests with supplemental information about um, what they're consuming. Um, and we, we tend to stick with more low dose items to begin with. Um, you know, I think I, it, I have to say in this particular category, in terms of having a good experience, um, I think it's really important that for your first couple cannabis experiences, you don't involve alcohol at all. And I don't see that happening as often as I should. And there's, I, I think you'll find that the majority of uh, negative first couple, first or second experiences that people may or may not have, they also were consuming um, a notable amount of alcohol. And so I hope that newbies and would suggest that they prepare, like we're used to having, always having a beverage in our hand in this country, especially in like a recreational setting. So, you know, pack yourself some LaCroix or a nice, like refreshing iced coffee, stay hydrated um, with non-alcoholic beverages and really just focus on enjoying the cannabis experience. <laughs> That's really solid advice. And, and so often when people go to a cannabis event as a newbie and they notice that there's a bar, they go to the bar first so they can get the drink <laughs> in their hands so that they feel comfortable. And that's when they start consuming. And now suddenly they're double dipping and they're not having the proper cannabis experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, so my biggest pet peeve are the stories that go, this, the, this person's night started, they decided not that they didn't want to consume an infused product. They started drinking and then decided, yeah, I might as well try it. And then like, they're already not set up for success. You just should, you really focus on experiencing the cannabis in a singular form and, and really making the most of it and seeing how the effects of it on your body and what you really enjoy about it. Um, and focusing on that um, is really like, is my best advice to people. And, and that's really important, too, for people who are you know, bringing in new cannabis enthusiasts because a lot of folks, if they don't have a good first experience, they're probably not going to be back. And we really do want them back because we yeah. want to push normalization. But also, you know, most media is writing about present cannabis users and cultures. And I, but I think that the new users who are learning about cannabis <clears throat> for the first time are really about to be influential. 
these, these crossover cannabis enthusiasts will comprise the biggest market cannabis has ever seen. And they come to the market with a much you know, wider range of motivations than simply getting high. You know, what are some of the most common motivators you hear from your guests and new customers about why they've come to cannabis? Hmm. You know, I think the core of most new users reasoning is happiness. Um, and whatever that means, like for, um, a lot of women in my demographic, um, that's getting a good night's sleep and, and, and how much, how important that is to their overall well being and happiness. Um, for others, um, that are starting to use it a bit more regularly is they're like spending all day cleaning their houses. Um, and, and are kind of like incorporating it into their lives and seeing, um, different ways that it can help them in their yoga practice and, and other ways, um, that is, you know, bringing them more happiness. I think, um, you know, women in my demographic between the ages of 35 and 55 consume more mind altering drugs on a daily basis than any other group of Americans through antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications. And so, and what we're doing there, you know, is taking a drug, seeking happiness, um, calm in our thoughts. And so I think a lot of women are going to find cannabis as a healthy substitute to some of those substances as well. Um, so at the end of the day, I feel like the most common motivators is seeking, um, seeking some more happiness in their lives. It's certainly not uncommon for me to hear from you know new cannabis enthusiasts that for them uh, cannabis, especially like low dose edibles or a tincture, is the new mommy's little helper, right? I mean, I've heard so many times that you know it's the main reason I don't kill my kids, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or your husband, right? No, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I mean this. We have a right in this country to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so um, definitely something you can find within cannabis somehow. It's one of the reasons why I think that, you know, essentially everybody's a patient because even air quotes recreational newser, users are still looking for uh, anti-anxiety, anti-stress, Absolutely. increased quality of life. Absolutely. Uh, I also think that these newcomers are a powerful force as as a consumer market, and they'll very quickly become an emboldened political block as well. You know, a political block who will also likely be more effective in you know communicating with the legislature because they look and they speak more like their legislators instead of much of the heritage cannabis lobby that shared so little in common with the politicians they are lobbying. Do you, do you think that the new cannabis enthusiasts? are quick to get involved in the activism aspects or are they still too far from th that being new to the scene? Um, I certainly hope so. Cause we absolutely need their help on every level. So I, I've, I hope it makes people more active politically, um, especially considering the current state of the union. Um, and they definitely should be because at the end of the day, I mean, we've seen so many, community benefits to um, having licensed marijuana businesses within your communities. Um, and we know that our roads are safer. We know that high school students here in Colorado are using less um, illicit drugs overall. Um, and there's a lot of tax advantages and other ways that you can incorporate the benefits of having cannabis businesses in your community. Um, as long as you're part of actually making that legislation and, and part of bringing it there. Um, I am concerned. I, I mean, in Colorado, as far as I'm concerned, we have this like gold standard because effectively it's, it's close to unlimited licensing relative to other States. And as a result, we've been able to see so many wonderful small businesses and mom and pop dispensaries in mountain towns flourish. And it's amazing. And it's the type of like small business revolution and, and what I hear, especially with incorporating hemp, but you know, small business agricultural revolution that is, that is, it, you can see the future if we make the right decisions um, from a regulatory perspective, and and if we allow access to this business to small business owners that 
you know, don't have the, the, the big dollars that now are necessary in new states coming on to acquire a cannabis business license. Um, so I hope people, more people get involved in finding out exactly how regulations are being incorporated in their states if they live in prohibition states so that they ensure that small business owners and local um, community interests are taken into account as uh, marijuana licenses are issued. After the break, we're going to talk more about those entrepreneurs. You are listening to Shaping Fire, and my guest today is Jane West, founder of Women Grow and CEO at Jane West. Businesses everywhere are constantly striving to reach out to people through advertising. We all know, though, that trying to reach a cannabis audience with a quality message is pretty difficult. That's why many people choose to advertise on the Shaping Fire podcast. Advertising on this show allows us time to talk about your product, service, or brand in a way that really lets people know what sets your company apart from others. Bold people who own companies know that getting into a relationship with their customers is essential. That is what we offer. We will explain your service or product and what sets it apart as desirable and help our audience get in contact with you. It's pretty simple, really. Advertising does not have to be all whiz-bang, smoke, and mirrors. Nowadays, I find that people prefer just to be spoken to calmly, accurately, and with good intentions. If you want to make your own commercial spot, you can do that too. Because the podcast is young, but growing at an exceptionally fast rate, if you become an advertiser on the Shaping Fire podcast now, you are going to pay a fraction of the cost we'll be asking for in just a few months. And yet everyone listening both now and to the back catalog of interviews later will hear about your company again and again for years. It's a great deal for you. Pay a small amount now because the show is new, but take advantage of the huge listening audience we will have forever. Do yourself a solid and contact us today for rates on podcast and newsletter advertising. Email hotspot at shapingfire.com to find out more. Welcome back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. I'm your host, Shango Lose, and our guest this week is Jane West, founder of Women Grow and CEO at Jane West. So, you know, in the last section, we were talking a lot about the people who came to the events and they had a great time and they found themselves wanting to stay in cannabis. They wanted to go to more events. They wanted to get more involved. Maybe they became activists. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that, you know, being more of an upscale audience, I can imagine that many of your guests immediately shared your vision and started cannabis businesses of their own. Did your edible events spawn a series of new cannabis entrepreneurs? I mean, I, I definitely get the impression that that is what occurred. And, and it's amazing to see. I mean, one of my colleagues from the very beginning, um, Heidi Keys, she started Puff Pass Paint in Colorado at the exact same time that I started Edible Events Company. And she is in like five states now and also has Puff Pass Pottery that one of uh, one of my fellow moms at my kid's school teaches they, and they make little pottery pieces, just like all the cannabis or canvas and cocktails classes. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I hope I, I definitely think it has. I get a lot of messages um, speaking to that. And that's great to see. And I hope we just continue to inspire more and more people to get into the space. Um, it's really about building a community and it's really, an ha there's so much room for growth here. Um, and I want to, I want more and more diverse groups to be joining the space so that that next generation can see themselves um, in what they want to build in the future. So I, I certainly hope so. And, um, it's fun to see all the new ideas and, and you need that new fresh energy and idealism, um, to keep you going through the like year three and four <laughs> of being an entrepreneur. So it's good to have, to have, um, have that energy coming in. So in 2014, you decided to go, you know, full on with your support of new entrepreneurs and you raised $42,000 to launch Women Grow. Would you say that this was the next logical step for you after, after cultivating all these new cannabis enthusiasts that, that you might as well help them succeed by networking in a cannabis world and help the industry evolve in a healthier way than it would have without as many women leaders? 
Well, there were there were two things that were obvious to me in 2014, and and one of them was this incredible demand and interest to have in, a job in the space, and and how there just wasn't access to even find out how to start doing that. For instance, um, when I started my business, I could search the word cannabis within my LinkedIn profile and get through maybe like two or three pages of people who actually had that word in their bio anywhere and be done. And now that it just, it's endless. There's thousands of people. I have over 10,000 contacts and, and most of them are in some way, shape or form in the cannabis space. So, um, so we needed to get them more connected back in 2014. And then secondly, it became very clear that at the end of the day, marijuana legalization is a local issue. And if you're going to succeed and if you're going to have a successful business in your community, you're going to have to work with your local community, your local regulators and have a network of other businesses and colleagues that will help you succeed in your area. Um, I women were contacting me almost daily in 2014 with all the different like media news stories that were coming out about what I was building with edible events and asking me how I can get into the space. How can I do this? How can I get in the space? I want to get more involved. I want to start your business. Now, now let's be clear in like April of 2014, I had just been fired from my job in corporate America, which I did not think would happen as quickly as it did. And then also, I had had a SWAT team attend one of my events and and was told that I couldn't even hold those anymore. So I didn't necessarily think I was the best person to be providing um, career advice to people. But I did observe that it was the local network of support that the women here in Colorado referenced when it came to why their businesses were a success and who they turned to um, for support. And we needed to create those local networks among all the different women that were reaching out to me to get into the space. And by offering them a platform to possibly, you know, start their own women grow market in their own city and then have that position while they build their network and while they build their contacts, it all, you know, seemed to make sense um, and be win-win. So um, that's what we started doing. And and it's been incredible to watch it grow and and how different each chapter is in each city and how they've flourished. It's amazing. Creating this new opportunity and creating this new opportunity in so many new cities, it brings a lot of different kinds of people. You know, I was uh, I interviewed um, AC Braddock from Eden Labs, who I believe is a Women Grow member, uh, just last week, and and you know we talked about the apparent difference in approach between folks who you know see the healing powers of cannabis versus the folks who are just here to make a buck. The the plant teaches those who use it how to be you know less authentic authoritative, less greedy, more open to experience. And yet there are others coming from other industries who may not even toke and who see cannabis as merely a commodity to make money with. Um, what's, what's your own vision of the future? Do you think that we're more likely to warm these newcomers to cannabis up to the spiritual side? Or do you think that there may always be this schism between folks in cannabis for the heart of it versus those here just to fill the balance sheet? Hmm. Um, that's an interesting question. You know, I feel like for a lot of people who are looking for jobs within the industry, especially um, a lot of the women that I work with who like are looking to apply some of their like soft skills to the cannabis business, like for instance, like training or HR or bookkeeping or marketing, um, photography, graphic design, you know, they're interested in what we're building here and especially in how many female led businesses they can work, work for and work with. And, and that's awesome. And a lot of them then as a result of learning about a product or learning about marketing it or learning about a business, um, decide that they want to try cannabis and that how, maybe start thinking about how they can incorporate the, it into their lives. And, and those seem to be the individual and a, a handful of women uh, like Becca Foster, um, are lost a ton of weight and, and looked, turned over a new leaf and found all the wellness benefits of the product as, as well. And, um, and so that's really fun to see when, when someone, because they've 
their career path has brought them into the space, started to, you know, utilize the plant more and really, uh, you know, open their eyes to all the benefits. Um, on the other side, I would, I'm more concerned about, um, individuals that don't use the plant or don't have a relationship with cannabis at all that are coming in on the more like big money and investors side. Um, because they're in control of the businesses and they're in control of the products and they're making decisions about marketing these products. And if you don't have, um, and in, in, in a, a close relationship with, the plant with how and why you incorporate cannabis into your life. And also therefore hopefully an understanding of like the social justice issues and why the war on drugs is war on people and how all of that is part of the history of this plant and, and part of legalization, you know, it becomes concerning that now there's so much money in this space that the people, people make ultimately making the decisions and are in positions of power may not have that uh, like kind of the education that I would hope they would have that you can only get from incorporating cannabis into your life or really, you know, learning more about the war on drugs um, and what it's done and how it's, you know, decimated families um, from the very beginning. So so that's kind of a loaded question. Um, yeah, yeah, it's totally well, loaded. <laughs> and, you know, I think that it's something that we're all going to have to deal with, right? Because for certain, the, um, more, more the, often than not, the visionary behind the company um, who hopefully is, is, is creating the brand experience and the copywriting, they probably are in cannabis because they're passionate about it. But then you start to bring in outside investment. And it's amazing the, you know, the, the visionary CEO uh, certainly has influence. But there's no qu- question that, that where the money comes from is also an influencer. And I think that the best thing that we can do is normalize and, and invite these people into cannabis as as consumers as quickly as we can. I actually loved the, the, the one that you said, um, you know, people who have, um, you said something like inst- in, not, 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 uh, involved cannabis in their life. And, and, I, and I pictured, you know, an evangelist on the street, you know, going up to people, have you, ex- have you uh, accepted uh, cannabis into your life? <laughs> oh. so so your your own line of new products known as the jane west collection are a wonderful balance of you know both beauty and functionality they're discreet and yet instantly recognizable from like a, a branding point of view they're they're nice borosilicate pieces made in partnership with grav labs who i've been a fan of for a long time and you know grav is known for their simple elegance I dare say that the Jane West line looks to be like the Kate Spade of cannabis. They're (laughs) high-end design, super desirable, and really functional. And in your advertising copy, you make it clear that your market are these new cannabis consumers and, and, you know, uh, especially women. As, As Jane West, the company, brings new products to the market, what do you want to offer these new users that they're not already finding elsewhere? Well, you know, just like the events that I created, I wanted these products to exist and I couldn't find anything that ma- in the market that matched my aesthetic. Um, and so um, I'm hoping to just fill the, the, that gap that I see existing there. Um, I've definitely wanted something with um, a lot of functionality, but that also had that sleek design that you would have, you know, the more we normalize cannabis use, the more um, these products will be out in your home and that you will um, use them for entertaining with guests. And so the way I picture a legal future, you know, people have, you know, little pipes around their home in the same numbers and proportions that they have little shot glasses. <laughs> and so um, so in order to have a collection and in order to like, just like you have eight wine glasses at your house, you want these replicable products. You want something, um, that matches the aesthetic of your home, something you would put out for guests. And so that's what I wanted to bring into the world, um, and to create, um, we have flower hour here at my house, just like happy hour. And so these are the products that are part of that like dream future of mine. 
the market segment that you and I've been chatting about today is rapidly expanding and the, and the copywriting and products to reach them has not really been invented yet. What advice do you offer um, other entrepreneurs who want to reach this market as well? Um, I don't, I would, let's see, um, first and foremost, do not assume what your customers want. Now for me and what I'm building, it's a little bit easier because I'm only creating what I want to use and products that I would use on a daily basis. Um, and so that's kind of my check mark. Um, but as you're creating products for, you know, a larger demo and users beyond yourself as well, you should talk to your customers a lot more than you think. Um, identify some individuals that you think will be your exactly your core customers and make sure you're involving them in conversations early on about the products. Just like I have wide ranging focus groups for all of my products as well. Um, you'll learn little things that you haven't even thought of yet that are crucial in terms of talking to new consumers. Um, for instance, I was in a branding meeting last year where we kept referring to different strains. We were like, well, what strain should we use this for? And what strain should we use that for? And, and one of the, the newbies there was like, why are you saying strain? It sounds like an illness, like a disease, like a strain. <laughs> She's like, why don't you call it like a varietal? And, and like, that's more like wine. And that's what you really mean, right? It, these are different varieties of cannabis, right? And, and that's the type of like important learning um, that helps us as we start to like literally create this lexicon, Um in a whole new market. Um, and so talk to your consumers. Um, secondly, I would make sure you're telling the truth. <laughs> I, I have like a problem overall with marketing and branding in this country. You know, I have a shampoo in, I'm, I'm 40 years old. I have a shampoo in my, in my shower right now that says that it's going to like prevent my hair from breaking or turning gray and extra moisturizes all the cells of my skull. And like, I don't know if all of that is true. It seems like a stretch. Um, so when we're really educating consumers about this brand new product, let's not exaggerate. Let's be, you know, as straightforward as we can about the products. Um, let's keep it uh, clean and, and let's make sure, you know, we're educating the consumer um, about how to incorporate these products into their lives. Um, and a lot of that's anecdotal and, and a lot of people will be talking, talking firsthand with your customers. Um, and with happy customers is a great way to find out more information about how they utilize your product. Um, yeah. And then lastly, just keep, if you keep creating what you love, then you, you're going to be fine. <laughs> You'll be on the right path. Like that, you know, there's vision is really everything in this space right now because we're creating this new market and um, in order to actually have your company scale and succeed, you're going to be, you're going to need to be able to have a shared vision of what this future looks like. And so, you know, make sure you're defining that for yourself as you set out and figuring out the best way to communicate that to the rest of your team so that, you all know what you're working on and, and why. Um, and the teams that I see succeeding most in this space right now um, have that shared vision of what they're bringing to the market. And you can see it in the products they're creating. It's been a lot of fun chatting with you. You know, it's, it's great to <clears throat> go through an interview with a smile on my face the entire <laughs> time. Thanks for being on the show, Jane. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. I can't wait to come out to your island. You can learn more about Jane and view her cannabis accessories at janewest.com. You can find more episodes of the Shaping Fire podcast and subscribe to the show at shapingfire.com and on Apple iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. If you enjoyed the show, we'd really appreciate it if you'd leave a positive review of the podcast wherever you download. Your review will help others find the show so they can enjoy it too. On the Shaping Fire website, you can also subscribe to the weekly newsletter for insights into the latest cannabis news and product reviews. On the Shaping Fire website, you will also find transcripts of today's podcast as well. For information on me and where I will be speaking, you can check out shangolos.com. Does your company want to reach our national audience of cannabis enthusiasts? Email hotspot at shapingfire.com to find out how. 
Thanks for listening to Shaping Fire. I've been your host, Shango Lose.